Um, good evening. My name is David Levine. I'm co-chairman of Science Writers in New York. Behind the cameras is the other co-chairman of Swiney, um, Joe Bonner. And my guest tonight is Robin Loy, who actually was a you were a past board member of our of Swiney. And Robin is a journalist. Um, according to your bio, you're, you you go back to the Galileo mission to Jupiter, you're a contributing editor to Scientific American where you were news editor from 2009 to 2015. You're also a member of the National Association of Science Writers. And you have a weekly, weekly newsletter or semi-weekly newsletter, semi-twice a month newsletter called Smart, Useful Science Stuff About COVID-19. And, I, and I, I started getting that and saying, wow, Robin really um, rounds up all the major news stories and gives comments on them and also makes some comments about other things going on. And she's also president of the Council for the Advancement of Science Writing. So I wanna start Robin, thanking you for being here. Um, we, we do get questions in advance and one of the first questions is how do I join the Council for the Advancement of Science Writing? Sure, thanks for having me. I'm really um, honored to be asked to participate and I've really enjoyed this series and especially since you went on Zoom during the pandemic, so thanks. Um, yeah, the Council for the Advancement of Science Writing is actually um, a council. It's not a membership organization and our mission is to improve, and, uh, improve the quality and quantity of science news that reaches the public, very simply. So we have about 16 board members and um, a small endowment that we use to basically um, uh, support trainings for science writers, um, uh, support and organize our, uh, you know, an annual conference, the Science Writers Conference that probably a lot of science writers know about is um, often referred to as the NASW conference, which it was until, um, you know, 15 or so years ago, it was, pretty much their conference, but we merged um, a conference that we held every year with their conference, and now it's the Science Writers Conference. So we put a lot of energy into that, every, um, which we hold uh, every October uh, somewhere in the country, moves around. Um, and we have a bunch of awards too, and fellowships that we support for, um, there's one for um, journalists uh, under 30 years old, uh, there's a medical career award that we give out, and we have a new one that's kind of a big deal. It's a um, $20,000 grant, the Sharon Begley Science, Re uh, Science Re Reporting Award, and it's both um, a project grant and an award. So uh, the applications for that award just uh, opened on January 1st, so if you're interested in that, it can support basically a reporting project that you have. Um, that's uh, oriented toward mid-career journalists. So make sure to visit casw.org if you're interested in learning about the council or applying for any of our fellowships or trainings or uh, awards and learning more about what's going on with the Science Writers Annual Meeting and our other activities. So, so far the meetings have been virtual. Um, and you, For the past two years, we, they've been online. Yeah, we're going to try, of course, um, this year to not do that. And where will, and where will it be? Oh, um, it's set to be, uh, boy, in, um, I'm spacing out, I think it's Memphis this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Memphis, Tennessee. Okay, that'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, I got a little uh, distracted because we were supposed to be in Boulder last fall, and so I've kind of got Boulder on the brain, but Boulder now will be pushed ahead to 2023. Okay, um, so I really enjoy smart, useful science stuff about COVID-19. Um, it does give a lot of information about, um, you know, you say about booster shots, about, um, different strains, um, you know, statistics and all these things. Um, so, and it's also, you, it's, it's on Substack. And I don't, why don't you explain to what's, you know, first of all, how, why, why'd you start it? And why'd you choose Substack and explain what Substack is? Yeah, sure. I, um, I started it because I, I felt like I could really make a contribution after all these years of working in science and health journalism and being a news editor. 
I and and also working in science publicity for the American Museum of Natural History. Um, you know that that played a huge role too, because uh, um, part of my job there was to know what the science news outlets were and to stay on top of what they do. So that actually helped me when I went back into journalism after five years at the museum. Know to understand you know what outlets specialize in what kind of coverage and which ones are really high quality or which ones specialize in biomedicine versus space exploration. So I had a really good sense of the landscape um, when I returned to journalism, did a little more science news editing. And, uh, you know, but, but the real impetus was not simply that I could make a contribution. It was that I, I think a lot of us, it makes me a little emotional to think about it. A lot of us um, realized that our families were um, struggling, you know, with, understanding um, what was going on and how to behave and how to stay safe and what the threats were, what the risks were and, and, and what information to rely on and what information to you know, set aside and, and be skeptical of. And so I felt like basically I wanted to start this newsletter to help um, my extended family and friends um, and, and also my colleagues, some of my closest colleagues. And um, I felt like there was, um, you know, uh, as we all know, there there was, especially in the first year in 2020, there was, um, you know, just a blizzard of information. And um, it's not, I don't really mean to be critical saying this, but it, a lot of it was not 100% accurate. And it was hard to make sense of very limited information. Um, there was not a lot of robust science yet on the virus and on the public health measures that you could take. So I felt like a service that I could provide to people I was close to was to round up what I thought was the best and most useful information on how to stay safe and what we knew about um, the virus. And also a lot of the people like in my kind of closer circles, we all kind of we have a, an appreciation or a fondness for science and for evidence-based information. And so I was very much writing to that audience that said, look, you know, I, I want to know what the good science is on this. I'm not interested in a lot of politics or policy arguments. Just tell me what we know and, um, and tell me of all the things that I'm hearing about, what is the most reliable information that is grounded in evidence, grounded in strong research. And of course, there could only be, you know, the research could only be so strong in May of 2020, in July of 2020, but I tried to direct people's attention to what seemed to me as a former news editor and a longtime science journalist, you know, the most trustworthy, the most reliable. And again, because I had been reading science journalism for so long, both as a reporter and, and an editor, and, and then also as a publicist when I was at the museum, uh, I really kind of knew where to look and I knew how to boil it down and um, communicate it um, pretty well to um, people who are not science journalists to lay people, but people who do appreciate science. And I, you know, the useful thing that, that, you know, trying to write a newsletter that's useful is really challenging to me because I want to write on and on and on thousands of words, but I try to keep the blurbs short. I was better in my first year at this. And um, I try to keep the overall length of the newsletter, especially when I was putting it out daily, I tried to keep myself to six or seven entries. And uh, that kept me focused on what do my readers really need to know. I didn't need to get a lot of statistics in the piece because everyone was, those numbers just kind of like were washing over people. It, it was still very hard to uh, find meaning in these numbers, you know, and to, under, to get your head around them. And so um, I felt like, you know, every new thing that the FDA and the CDC and the White House were disputing, particularly in 2020, um, and politicians, um, I, I felt like, you know, anybody could follow that horse race, you know, they didn't really need me for that. But like, what was the best public health guidance? And what do we know about this virus? That was harder to pull out of um, the dialogue. And there were, a, there, were a, there were a lot of pieces on that. And, and that's what I tried to focus on synthesizing for my readers. So as for Substack, I started 
the newsletter um, just as like a, a Gmail BCC, you know, I would BCC everyone. At first I was CCing like 10 people in my family and friends. And then I was BCCing, you know, I started letting more people slowly know, like um, colleagues and little online groups that I was members of. I started letting more people know that I was writing this newsletter pretty much every day. In, um, I started it, I think, in um, like March or April of 2020, April, I think, very early April of 2020. And I started letting more people know about it. And I started having problems with Gmail. I mean, I so I was like, well, I'll start a different Gmail account. Maybe that'll fix it. No. And then I started talking to people and realized, you know, Gmail doesn't really want you bulk mailing <laughs> from your Gmail account um, or it, 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 whatever. However, I was using it, I was starting to have problems or the email was getting sorted into people's bulk mail mailbox and they weren't seeing it. So I realized um, I needed a better distribution system. And also I didn't really have a, um, a great archive. What I do is I just copy it into a Google doc. And in fact, anybody that URLs at the bottom of every issue of the newsletter and anybody can go to my G doc, which has um, every single newsletter that I've written in it, but um, you know, it takes like a few minutes to load because it's really long now, hundreds of pages long. But um, so I started um, talking uh, to folks about what were the best email distribution systems. Um, and I got some really good free advice on that um, from a gentleman who writes a really good newsletter called This Is Not A Newsletter. <laughs> and I, I'm forgetting his name right now. I, wasn't, I didn't prepare this in ahead of time, but um, just look up This Is Not A Newsletter. And he basically is like the guru of newslettering, right? And as a public service, he was um, helping uh, writers who were interested in starting newsletters during the early months of the pandemic. He was just giving them 30 minute free consults. And so I took one of those. And um, he steered me toward, um, toward a few services that I could use to distribute the newsletter. Uh, but, and one of them he mentioned was Substack and I checked it out. I think um, I, I looked at a couple others and they were a little more complicated to use. And Substack is just dead easy. Um, you know, starting it, there were just a few fields I had to fill out and it was pretty easy to import my um, mailing list. So just to copy it from the BCC field of Gmail and then load it into Substack was pretty easy. And um, I just had to refine a, a blurb for what the newsletter was about, um, just like four or five sentences, what the goal of it was. And then I could um, start publishing there. So it has sort of like, um, what you see is what you get interface. So you can just sort of write or edit in the interface that Substack provides. Um, and then basically you hit the publish button and it goes to your, <laughs> to your list. And, uh, and so I didn't have to worry anymore about BCCing or, you know, you can schedule when it publishes. Um, it doesn't have to publish right when you hit publish. Um, it, uh, you know, it gives you uh, it, you, know, you can see your whole mailing list. Um, I don't know, I, and it archives everything too, which is really nice. Um, it's a little hard to scroll through all the archiving. Some people don't love the archiving, but it, it's sufficient for my needs. Plus I have the Google doc that has just the boring text, um, you know. Um, so, do you, so how much does it cost you to do this? It's actually, the platform's free. Now uh, I am probably not Substack's favorite uh, user because uh, what they really want is for you to charge for the newsletter. And then I think, I forget, I don't know if they skim off the top or something. That's their business model is people um, collect, uh, is, 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 is trying to get people to charge for their newsletters. But um, I just haven't felt comfortable charging for it. I did accept donations on Patreon for it for, for a while. Um, and especially in 2020, I was working really hard on it um, and really steadily. Uh, it's pretty much everything, all I was doing work-wise um, for a few months. Uh, but uh, eventually, uh, pretty much, I don't know, the last several months, I've not been including the solicitation for donations, voluntary donations at the bottom of the newsletter when I put it out anymore. Um, and, you know, I'm not completely, I'm not like refusing any donations right now, but I'm no longer soliciting them. Um, I was never in this to, to make money. So I was always a sort of a public service, something I'm very fortunate that I can afford to do. So um, I didn't, I didn't want to make raising money the point of it. I mean, it's just, it's the only pandemic, uh, you know, that, uh, I don't know, 
it's, it's, it's a big deal. And um, I felt like I had to step up and this is what I wanted to do. Well, if there's any consolation, we don't charge for this and we don't make any money. <laughs> yeah, no, I really, I noticed that. I kept saying to people, hey, it's free. <laughs> Great. So, um, yeah. So, um, so someone said Dan Roshinsky is the. Oh yeah, Dan Roshinsky. That's the guy. Yeah, wonderful guy. That's in the chat, and someone said uh, this is from Rosalind Reed. Um, we both know. Um, Samantha, if you're asking about CSW, we don't offer internships or paid training. You might check out the internship fair organized by NASW in conjunction in con connection with the American Association of Advancement of Science annual meeting. It works with Robin. It's, I work with. She works with Robin at CSW. And the AAAS meeting is in February. Right. It's virtual. Yep. Which is virtual. Yeah. And I've actually um, done. A, I've done some mentoring of people there. Oh, nice. So it's been good. Um, so what are, what are the um, typical stories that you enjoy? What do you, what do you enjoy writing about in your newsletter? Oh, uh, wow. Well, I have a bunch of headings that um, have sort of become the primary headings that uh, I use to group information. So, um, you know, initially it was a little more science focused just on, you know, what is this virus? What kind of a virus is it? Um, how does how does it spread? Um, but eventually I started including a lot of news you can use. So public health information. So, um, you know, there were, uh, there were informational pieces like um, Tara Parker Pope writes at the New York Times that really, you know, would really lay out like, here are the best masks to use and here's why they're good. Or, um, you know, STAT would have updates. They still have great updates on what's going on with the development of tests, what's going on with the development of drugs, what's going on with the development of, um, uh, vaccines, of course, they were really great on following um, progress toward the uh, COVID vaccines and um, what we're learning about boosters. Um, you know, Sharon Bagley was on staff there before she died and was doing um, some coverage of COVID and uh, Helen Branswell was there. These are people who've won um, the Council for Advancement of Science Writing uh, Victor Cohen Award for medical writing. So they have some great um, reporters there um, on the virus, but on the, on the, on the pandemic. Um, so, uh, you know, I basically have a bunch of outlets that I really like to look at. And I was more systematic when I was, you know, the first year and a half that I was doing the newsletter. But I would say in the last six months, I've more used the newsletter to round up the things that have jumped out at me. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't usually do like really policy or politically centered stories because you can get that somewhere else and it just makes people anxious. <laughs> it's not really that useful for um, the people that I'm aiming this newsletter at. So uh, I'm trying to just give, you know, there's a little bit of myth busting I do in it, but mostly I'm not um, writing a newsletter that debunks the latest, um, you know, uh, misinformation about the virus. Mostly it's about um, you know, like, I mean, I've done a few, I found a few things like, you know, does the vaccine, you know, uh, cause fertility issues? No, you know, is the risk of getting vaccinated higher um, than the risk of COVID? No, you know, and, um, you know, just, there's a few myth busting pieces and explanatory pieces, but um, mostly I, I try to help people make their own decisions. Um, I like service pieces that tell people like, well, here are the risks of traveling by airplane. And um, here's what we know about staying in hotels. Here's what we know about eating in restaurants. Here's, you know, so um, very um, pragmatic pieces that are um, very accessible also. And I'm always looking for good uh, graphic pieces, pieces that are, that use visual storytelling, not just videos, um, because videos, sometimes you have to sit still for two or three minutes and really listen you know, or longer to get the message. I mean, sometimes those are good if they're short enough, but I'm also looking also for just, yeah, stories that are told graphically or with graphics. Of course, the New York Times does these amazing interactive graphic pieces, but STAT has done some nice graphic pieces. Um, you know, a lot of outlets, um, science and nature do really good graphics. Scientific American had um, really a state of the art issue about the virus that came out in um, like the fall, I think, or summer of 2020, 
that um, like I still consult to try to um, remember the science details of the virus. So, um, you know, I, I think some of my readers really appreciate the, the visual, uh, visually told stories and um, there's actually kind of a shortage of those. So when I find them and they seem to be really um, trustworthy, I try to make sure uh, they're in there because not everyone wants to sit and read a long story you know, about scientific research or about, they don't wanna read a long narrative piece. Um, and, and that's really one of my concerns about the coverage that I have been rounding up and, and, and reading and consuming for the past 22 months is that a lot of it is, you know, the bulk of it is narrative. And, um, you know, there's just not a lot of stuff that's boiled down to news you can use and to really answer people's questions about ventilation, about masks, about vaccines, about testing. Testing's the big one right now. How do readers interact with you? A lot of them don't interact with me that much. Um, they can comment, but I don't really get a lot of comments. They can't email me. So sometimes I get emails. Um, I have a few like really dedicated readers who say, hey, take a look at this, or here's something you should know about. They might um, message me on Twitter or they email me. Um, uh, but mostly um, I'm, I'm kind of publishing into the, into the void, I have to admit. For those listening, um, please put your questions in the Q&A box, um, not the chat box, because um, I'm reading from the Q&A box. The chat box is just in case we have technical difficulties for um, Robin and, and Joe and myself to communicate. Um, so I have a question. Um, this is from someone I believe in Australia. Hello, I'm moving forward. When you have face-to-face -face conferences, can you also have the conferences online for international science journalists? I think oh, yeah. Been, yeah. You're talking about the Science Writers Conference that we do every year with um, yes. that CASW and NASW put on? Yeah, um, they are, they, lately um, we've been, um, they've been hybrid. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. The past two years they've been virtual only. Um, I think going forward there is discussion of having both virtual and in-person components. They may not be, they may or may not be simultaneous, um, but we, we see the value of uh, virtual meetings for sure. Um, we also really miss the value of in-person meetings. So, um, you know, and, and the truth is that putting on a hybrid meeting is, um, well, look, put, putting on a virtual meeting is really a lot of work, especially when you've been planning for an in-person meeting and putting on, um, you know, a, a hybrid meeting is um, something we haven't done a lot of either. So um, it's, more work. So we're still sort of figuring out how to thread that needle, how to meet the needs of the, the, the largest number of, of people that we can and reaching international audiences is, is something, you know, it's always been something that we uh, want to do at CASW and have done by participating in the World Conference of Science Journalists, particularly when we hosted it in 2017, um, co-hosted it with some of the organizations and also with some of the um, collaborations that we uh, have, have done uh, with uh, travel fellowships, particularly to the annual science writing meeting. Um, there are also meetings I've been to at, um, well, I've been to World Congress of Science Journalists, but um, I've been to the Lindau, Lindau Nobel Laureates Week several times, and I've also been to the Heidelberg Laureates Forum, and there's the, um, there's, there's another, you know, journalist organization that has conferences in Europe and European Conference of Science Journalists. So there are, there are opportunities to go to these and there are also opportunities to, um, and I imagine they're online as well. Um, someone said, are you on LinkedIn? As I can't find you to connect. Oh, me? Yeah, absolutely. Let me see if I can call it up real quick. Okay. I think it's, uh, here I am. It's uh, Robin hyphen Lloyd. Uh, anyway, I'll put it in the chat. <laughs> All right. Um, I mean the Q and A. Excuse me. You can put it in the chat. <laughs> yeah. Well, I suppose I could. Right. Uh, let's see. Okay. There. I finally did it. Okay. So covering COVID for all this time, like 
you know, I've been doing as well. What are, what are some of the most surprising things to you that have, that have happened? I mean, I've always been surprised by the amazing lack of understanding of um, keeping distant. Um, that's one thing Deborah Burks, I agreed with it. She said the Spanish flu, that one thing that saved people tremendously was social distancing. And I don't say, you know, I, I go to museums and I don't see people social distancing. You know, you go to, you know, uh, you're on lines at stores and people are not social distancing very well. I mean, I see some schools have, you know, little things for each kids to stand on, but, uh, you know, that, that was one of the biggest surprises for me. That, um, and also, really, there's a, really a lack of talk about ventilation. So two surprising things to me, like everyone thinks vaccines are the complete answer, but I said, there are other things you can do too, especially before we had vaccines. So, um, and I guess also the strength of the anti-vaccine movement, I was very surprised at. Um, I was very happy to see um, Neil Young um, say that he wants to take his, his music off Spotify as long as they have the Joe Rogan show on. So, and also as a tennis player, I've been following the Novak Djokovic story. So uh, my question to you is, what's, what are some things that you know, you've been interested in also, what, what have you been surprised at? You're reporting on COVID for almost two years. Um, in terms of the reporting or uh, just the pandemic? Either, both. Yeah. Um, in terms of social distancing, I think people did a great job with that for a few months and, and then, um, you know, school started and policy started changing in late 2020 and especially in 21. But um, it's not as easy to social distance now as it was, um, you know, 100 years ago. I mean, there's just so many, you know, there's like nine times more people on the planet and the bulk of us live in cities now. So, you know, there's just so much more um, crowding in general. I mean, people lived in crowded conditions for sure um, in cities uh, in, in, in the early 20th century, but, um, you know, there was a lot of people spread out too and we weren't as urbanized back then. So I kind of don't blame people. In general, I'm very, I just feel like being, you know, not blaming people <laughs> too much for their behavior with this, um, you know, so distancing, I don't know, in the Bronx too, where I live in New York City, there is still a fair amount of distancing um, and it, it is important, you know, and I think people forget that for sure, but I don't really want to shake a finger at people for, for forgetting that. Um, and masks are really valuable for that too, especially if you wear those um, blown plastic ones, um, like the surgical masks or the, KN94s or 95s and the N95s nowadays has been shown to be better and especially if they're well fitting. Um, so masks can do a lot even when you don't social distance if you're not hanging out for too long with people indoors. Um, let's see, uh, you also talked about uh, ventilation not being covered much. Yeah, I wish that was covered more. Not, not covered more, it's like hard to make that. Again, I, it, I really kind of I want to give everyone a break on that. It's like really hard to get excited about ventilation. <laughs> you know, it's like this is not even a word that came up in everyday conversation before. So um, I would love to see um, buildings improve their ventilation. And I, I wish more people owned air purifiers and or air cleaners and, and had could have them in their workplaces or carry them with them wherever they went. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I brought one to the classroom where I was teaching in, in the fall and um, it really gave me a sense of security. And um, you know, we didn't have a lot of outbreaks where I taught, but um, we certainly didn't have any in my classroom either. And that was really a relief. Uh, I don't know, the, the, I guess what surprises me in terms of the pandemic in general, you know, I'm just not really like a negative person or, uh, you know, it, everyone else, there's a lot of criticism out there already. I don't think I really need to add to that. Um, it's not really my forte either. I think one thing that surprises me is how fast we've responded actually, how fast the science, and it's just, you know, remember, um, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was like, oh, the fastest we've ever had a vaccine was four years and that was for months, you know, and it's like, well, we had, we got a vaccine in less than a year. It was pretty incredible. Um, you know, we have the solutions right in hand. I think one of the things I didn't anticipate was that even though the solutions to this pandemic are right in front of us, 
you know, the, the shortcomings of this country, you know, we're just not interested or, or willing and doing everything that we could do to end the pandemic. It's just, I, I didn't realize you know, how politicized this was gonna get, but like I said, I, you know, it's not really um, something I find productive talking about uh, or, or writing about. Um, so um, I'm, I'm really impressed with um, the coverage in general that I've seen in the media that I, that I read and that really um, I rely on for my newsletter um, in a way, um, you know, I, I, and I've written a few, a handful of stories on the pandemic and the virus, but um, you know, really, my newsletter benefits from the fantastic coverage that all of my colleagues are doing, um, and and I'm really just blurbing that and sending it out to people. So I'm pretty impressed with the coverage. Um, I, I I do think there could have been more, or there still could be more, you know, really service-oriented journalism, and there hasn't, in my mind. You, just, you almost can't do enough of that. And again, I would, would really like to see more visual communication of some of these messages. So we have, you know, we used to talk about the Museum of Natural History, you know, multiple entry points for, for people. You know, you can't just like throw long form narrative pieces at, um, you know, at, at your audience, at your, at your community and expect that to be the format that reaches and is engaging and interesting to everyone. It's it's unrealistic, it's, it's insane. <laughs> okay, so I have some questions. Um, sometimes science clashes with medicine due to the reality of how it is practiced and the realities of dealing with people. One good example is the reduction in isolation time. The compromise had to be made because most people weren't complying with 10 days anyway. Do you feel this can confound efforts to relate the science? Um, uh, I find that I'm, I'm struggling a little to parse the question. Um, I guess I think what I'm hearing is that sometimes the policy seems to not be supported by the available science, but I'm actually not one of the people who is on that bandwagon. Um, I think there is pretty good science to support the reduction in um, isolation and uh, you know, I think there've been trouble. There's been trouble on um, communicating that there is science behind some of these policy changes. That's, I think, maybe been. I hear him saying, "I'm not going to criticize," but you know, maybe we could have done better on that. Maybe the government could have done better on that. But um, you know, the challenges that they're facing are extraordinary. Um, so um, you know, mostly most people are not that infectious or not infectious after like five or six days. So. I mean, from what I'm, what, what I'm seeing, um, you know, there's not a huge mismatch there. Uh, yeah, I get a lot of my sort of like deep science information from this podcast you probably heard of if you're really interested in this stuff like I am called uh, This Week in Virology. And um, they just go through papers and papers and papers and go through you know, highlight findings that they think are really important and really kind of poke holes and some of the widely accepted under, you know, interpretations um, or communications of the latest science. And uh, it's been very helpful to me listening to that podcast. Okay. Um, have you given any thought to how you will decide when, if ever, you should, you should cease publishing your newsletter because the pandemic is no longer serious? Yeah, I think about it a lot. You know, I almost dropped it in the fall, partly because I was teaching and I didn't have a lot of time to put it out. In fact, I went an entire month, the month of October, without putting it out, out an issue, and I, I was not happy about that. But there was there was just no way I had other I had other editing going on for Scientific American and the teaching. It was hard. But eventually, in November, I was like, ah, oh, I found a win window and I, I put one out when Omicron or Omicron started being in the news, and I realized that I could really helped my readers by uh, giving them quick information about what we knew initially about that variant of concern. Mm -hmm. That ended up being a big deal, big problem, big surge in cases, of course, mm -hmm. and, and rise in hospitalizations and deaths nationwide. So um, that got me back on board and realizing that there was a need. So as long as there's a need for it, I'll, you know, I think I'm gonna be pretty motivated to do continue to do the newsletter. Um, you know, how do I determine when there's no longer a need? I guess 
you know, the closer we get to normal, which we probably won't, I don't know if we're ever going to get entirely back to it, but, you know, the more things open and, and, and once, you know, we reach something like, you know, the virus is endemic and, you know, get most, more and more of the nation vaccinated and the vaccines seem to be protecting people, maybe there won't be a need anymore, but, you know, I just keep hearing questions. I keep um, seeing people who are anxious, angry, uh, uncertain, confused. Um, and as long as people in my inner circle feel that way, I'm gonna be pretty motivated to keep putting out issues of the newsletter. And, and, I, and I keep seeing wonderful coverage and really important findings coming out. And it, it's hard for me to resist uh, sharing that information. So someone says, what are your favorite publications for COVID science information? And who do you trust for accurate information? All right, I prepared for this. I'm gonna just put it in the Q&A. Oh, there's no, let's see, how do I do it? Uh, in the chat. Okay, I'll put it in the chat because um, everyone. Okay, this is like um, a really long list, but now I'll, now I'll explain it a little bit, but like I said, this week in virology has been really important for me because they're scientists talking to one another. And I do not understand everything they say, not by a long shot, but by letting it wash over me and reading and studying a little bit now and then, I've kind of I, I can almost understand, you know half of what they talk about. And honestly, I don't sleep really well. So I use the pod, I, I use podcasts to fall asleep. So <laughs> I don't always get through all of them. But um, the ones that are really helpful that I really recommend and that are a little more accessible are um, every Friday, they put out an episode in which the primary host of the show, Vincent Racaniello, um, interviews Dr. Daniel Griffin, who works in the New York area at a bunch of hospitals, um, taking care of COVID patients. And, and he's up on the literature, the research too. Those episodes are great. Um, I also like In the Bubble, Andy Slavitt, former um, Obama and Biden administration um, healthcare staffer. And um, he has a really good podcast where he does really good, uh, he, really good interviews with experts. He did one with Michael Mina at, um, well, formerly of Harvard Public Medical School recently. Michael Mina is a huge advocate for um, rapid at home antigen tests and that was I recommend that episode um, and frankly I learned about it from my friend Esther Landheis who's um, a really good biomedical writer. Um, there are a couple Instagram feeds that are really good. Um, one is called Dear Pandemic and another one is called Unbiased SciPod. Um, they, they, and, and also this, uh, another uh, site that I really like um, is on Instagram, but I like her blog better. I get, she doesn't, um, her posts on Instagram are not as valuable as her blog posts, which are, which are written out. It's called Your Local Epidemiologist. And um, her website is, is, is really accessible. She does a lot of stuff that's oriented toward parents, but also vac she had, she was like the only person who had um, who made a chart that she updated every month or so for a while on um, the various vaccines that were available or, uh, and how, you know, what they're, efficacy was and then what uh, I forget yeah what the technology was behind them for whom they'd been authorized on an emergency basis so far she was the only place I could find that comparison of Moderna, Pfizer, J&J &J, etc um, that was pretty amazing and she's very dedicated I don't know how she gets that done on top of her job um, in terms of news sites my favorite ones absolutely science nature stat scientific american um, Kaiser Health News. Um, earlier in the pan New York Times, Washington Post, they have very good coverage too. Early in the pandemic, um, Medscape, I used them a lot. Um, they were really helpful. Uh, the Atlantic has some amazing um, coverage. Catherine Wu is off the charts, great writer about the about COVID, about anything, science, immunology. Um, Chemical and Engineering News early on had some really good uh, stories. Um, the New Yorker had some amazing long form pieces, but they're, they're episodic, you know, you just are not quite sure when, you know, they, they're not always, you know, it's not every week that they have um, a, a strong piece, whereas, you know, I have to check Science, Nature, Stats, Scientific American, Washington Post, New York Times, 
I have to check these every week for sure, you know, if not every day. And then I love these other sites too. They've had some, you know, landmark pieces wired, um, 538 Noah Bell Science News and Sonia Newsweek. The counter had really good stuff on the outbreaks in um, the meat, meat packing, um, meat processing plants. Um, they were they were right on top of the supply chain stuff. Um, I really love that site. Undark had some really good pieces. Um, Buzzfeed, Daily Beast, you know, everyone was contributing for a while, really routinely. And I get Sid Rapp's newsletter. That's the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. I get a bunch of newsletters, but Sid Rapp, Osterholm, Dr. Mike, Michael Osterholm is the um, the head uh, researcher there, and he's he's really interesting. He's been a little more conservative and and, and less risk tolerant in sort of his outlook on everything. Um, so, uh, but I but I still uh, you know um, I, I like hearing what he has to say. He, he I interviewed him. Um, last summer for a piece I was writing for the New York Times and everyone was like, yeah, just, you know, we didn't have all the tests back then. So it was like, yeah, um, just, you know, stay a little far away from each other. You know, you can be outside with people. Um, you know, maybe if everyone's vaccinated and there are no kids, you could be, and Osterholm was like, uh, I won't be in a crowd outdoors with people without a, an N95 on. He was like, <laughs> like hardcore and you know that was last summer everyone really wanted to circulate and try to find ways to be safe outside and maybe we didn't have to wear masks in all these situations and maybe we could even be inside for a certain amount of time perhaps if we were vaccinated and everyone else was and Ulster Home wasn't having it and I, I kind of grew fond of him for his um, strong stances which are science-based you know but you know, there are different interpretations, of course, of what we should be doing. Um, for, for those who don't want to take millions of notes, you can copy the chat by going to, there's a little button in the chat at the bottom on the left, I think the left side, um, where there, there are three dots and it says save chat. So you can save that, it will be saved on your computer. I finally learned that after a year. So I'm very happy about that. Um, you, you don't mention TV because um, a lot of people watch TV and uh, some of my guests are on TV, Paul Offit, John Moore, Robert said, they're on TV all the time. And I think, you know, I mean, TV segments are very short. I used to put people on TV when I worked in American Cancer Society and they're only like three minutes, but someone said you can impart a lot of information in a two minute segment. And Michael Osterham was on TV almost every day. Paul Offit said he just sits at his chair all day long and he's doing TV interviews, radio interviews, New York Times interviews. He's been on our show several times. And um, so I think, you know, so I think some of the TV shows and also like the Sunday morning shows, Dr. Fauci is on and things like that. And you're not gonna, and it's a, it's a great opportunity to actually, um, you know, hear them actually answer questions. and. From the from the TV, I think some of the um, news journalists are doing a, TV news journalists are doing a pretty good job. Oh, I, I agree. Um, you know, the first year I was watching, um, you know, I, I I was watching MSNBC like pretty much from like six p.m. to midnight, <laughs> like almost every night. And you know, some of those shows were just you know had that's where I learned who some of the you know important epidemiologists and infectious disease experts and doctors were who were on on the case of COVID and um, yeah those shows those shows were great and CNN has had really good coverage too and and, and some of the other networks as well I just kind of haven't been watching as much recently but um, you know I actually watch a lot of weather forecasts on my local Fox affiliate and okay. um, it, at the lunchtime hour they after the weather forecast, they have five points you need to know about the coronavirus. And every time my spouse is like, do you want to watch the five points? I'm like, yes, yes, I want to watch the five points about coronavirus. And they they just boil down what the latest, you know, policy changes or outbreak is or, you know, treatment news is. And it's 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 amazingly, it's a really good short burst. It's a burst of information. It's listy, which is very accessible. Um, and uh, yeah, I agree. There's a lot of good stuff out there on TV. You just have to choose, you know, again, you know, kind of be a savvy consumer, you, you know, figure out who the good ones are. Yeah, um, I, I think Osterheim is very good because he, he explains things very well. 
I think uh, Dr. Offit also explains things very well. Um, and he also talks about children. I think children are a very important story. I mean, I have some grandchildren who they're not vaccinated. The oldest one is four. And last week, um, some people tested positive in their class and the whole class you know, had to go home for a week. And that's tough on the parents, tough on, you know, so, I mean, I mean, I remember being very naive and telling my daughter, um, wow, this, you know, it must be nice to have this great bonding experience with your young children and family. And she said, I would trade places with you in two seconds. <laughs> You know, she said it's you know she said she said every day you know especially in the early days it was like Groundhog Day, you know she never got a break and having two young children at home must have been, a bit, I know it was very very stressful and, and she didn't really relax until she was vaccinated, so um, that's been tough. She, she lives in Riverdale, so um, but um, I, you know I think this this summer last summer. You know, I think with outdoor dining, you know, made people feel better. I remember going to Shakespeare in the Park, and that was the first play that plays that were done because it was outside, and people were just very so happy to be there. One of my friends said they could have just read the phone book, and people were just happy to be at a theater. So let's see. Um, another question: Is it worthwhile to address false? E.g., anti-vax info and reporting, or is it better left alone and ignored? Boy, it's a case by case thing. Um, if you, you know, what, what we usually say to reporters when we're talking about this issue is, you know, if if, if there's misinformation that's 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 really taken off, you know, that, that that's really spreading wildly, and there really needs to be, you know, a corrective mm -hmm. story <laughs> or many corrective stories, um, then 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 sure, write it. But we say make sure the top of the story has a truth sandwich in it. So instead of leading with the myth, you start your story with what is accurate, and then you say other people are mistakenly saying or, you know, are issuing this false information or lying or however you want to phrase it. And then you say, but this is incorrect again, you know, so you've sandwiched that incorrect statement with what we know based on evidence is accurate and, and true. So there's a way to do myth busting stories or uh, explanatory stories that, uh, you know, that, 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 that reveal the misinformation that's out there that doesn't, um, that hopefully minimizes the spread of that misinformation and really gets the truth out there um, and, you know, doesn't uh, have an opening for, you know, minimizes the opportunity for spreading that misinformation. So, um, you know, uh, in, it's a really hard decision and you know like you know like vaccine hesitancy you know like how, how much how much air time how much ink do you how many pixels do you give that you know um i was just looking up what the vaccination rate is for all ages in the u.s according to the new york times site which i religiously look at every day we're at 76% for one dose, fully vaccinated 63. You know, it, it gets better in the older age groups, five and up 81% one dose, 68% fully vaccinated. I don't know, my father's an optimist and I just I just try to look on the bright side with, with that, um, you know, instead of, so, so I'm really more interested in, you know, uh, lately I'm interested in like, what makes people who have concerns get vaccinated? So what works? What's effective at helping people allay their anxieties? I, you know, it, it's my understanding that, you know, it's, it's among the people who aren't vaccinated yet, it's, it's not all, it may not even be the majority who are just absolutely against getting the vaccine and really hate all vaccines or are part of you know, movements against vaccination. It's, it's, it's more nuanced than that and access is a big issue. And just having unanswered questions um, can be an issue. Um, you know, they're, they're, especially when you're a parent, there, there's so many vaccines nowadays that, um, you know, parents are responsible for, that doctors are responsible for making sure that kids get. 
Um, it's not like when I was growing up, there were a number of vaccines, but it, there's, there's a lot more now. I actually just ordered a book called Vaccine Nation that talks about the rise of the vaccination industry. And it started you know, in the decade that I was born, in the 1960s, pretty much. And I'm really looking forward to learning about that because um, you know, we've had a huge cultural shift on vaccines. And as much as I wish every single person who it was safe for would get vaccinated and, and boosted in the, you know, in the whole world, um, you know, it's easier said than done. It's there's a lot of you know, institutional and cultural issues um, that are behind all this. Well, going back to Neil Young again, one of the reasons he's a vaccine advocate is that he, both he and Joan Mitchell were born in um, late 1940s, and they both had polio. Yeah, so they're big right. believers. They're big believers in, in vaccines. They, 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 they both also have some other crazy ideas on science, but vaccines, I think their ideas are good. Um, yeah, well, it'll be really interesting to see how the COVID generation uh, feels about vaccines in 20, 30 years. I think we can have a pretty good guess. Well, I know some people like, you know, my children, they love getting, getting vaccinated. I mean, not getting vaccinated, they love, you know, you know having vaccines and they're, they embrace them, got them as soon as they could. I have friends who got them as soon as I could. I have friends who are now deciding whether to get a fourth booster, even though they're not authorized to get a fourth booster. Um, so it's, you know, it is very interesting. I mean, I, I'm doing a story where I'm, I, spoke to, I spoke to someone in Africa and he was saying, he's in Nigeria, and he's saying only 4% of Nigeria is vaccinated. But he said, yeah. that, um, and he said that the vaccines they, they send us have a, they're, they're, they have only one month left of shelf life, so yeah. it's it's not, it's not it's not like they're not willing to get them, but not getting them. But also for some reason in Africa, and they don't know exactly why, but the yeah. hospitalization death rates are, are very low. So people are saying, "Well, I can't get the vaccine anyways." So and then it, that kind of leads the vaccine. Why should I get vaccinated? <laughs> you know, if, not, if people aren't getting sick. Um, right. I mean, I've also, you know, heard about, you know, there are um, COVID parties where people are like, you know, kind of like the chicken pox parties where people think, well, you know, let's get the armor come over, I'll get a little more protection. And um, I think, well, the danger to that is, you know, some, you know, there is long-term COVID, I've done shows on that. And also, you don't know if, you know, there is still, still Delta variants going around. And there, and there are newer variants going around. So I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't really look, I don't think it's a great idea to, you know, expose yourself to an illness that you don't have to. It's not a good idea. Um, I heard a talk at the New Horizon, at, at the Council for the Advancement of Science Writings um, sessions at Science Writers last fall. And this uh, researcher who worked at one of the NIH, um, one of the National Institutes of Health, uh, institutions, one of the branches saying that every respiratory infection leads, you know, has long-term effects, some long-term effects. And I, I, you know, I still want to follow up with that and, and write about that. I have a friend. It's just, it's just, it's just, you know, <laughs> this, is, this is not a good idea. Um, mm -hmm. Not only that, let's say there were no long-term effects and we weren't going to get long COVID. What's to say you're not going to spread it to someone for whom it is a really big problem? I just I don't want to be that person who spreads it to someone who ends up getting severe COVID. I think it's a little irresponsible to our communities to to to, to do that. Okay, so um, I, I have one more question, and then I'm going to let you go. Enjoy your night. Oh, okay. okay. Um, I think we actually answered that question. So I'll dismiss it. Um, so I, I like to ask people, what do they do? So have you done, did you do outdoor dining when it was warmer? Oh yeah, yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, yeah, I did a little indoor um, dining uh, as well in uh, this, I guess, I, f I forget exactly when I, when I stopped doing it sometime last fall. But um, yeah, to be honest, I was I was doing a little indoor dining because there weren't a lot of people and uh, the case rates in New York City where I live were really low and um, mm -hmm. I was vaccinated and feeling positive <laughs> about being indoors now and then. You know, I, I don't I don't I wasn't in busy crowded places, but in uncrowded 
places. Have you gone? To, I mean, I went to the theater when when it opened, and it was, I thought. It was oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm almost ready to start hanging out in small groups indoors for, actually, I have, I, I kind of have a pod, you know, um, so we just a couple weeks ago, um, my pod expanded from my household to a couple other people who were kind of our pod, you know, in 2020, mm -hmm. early 21 before we got vaccinated. So, um, you know, I'm starting to, to, to dip my toe in um, short indoor uh, gatherings with a small number of trusted people who I know are vaccinated um, and uh, you know, partly for mental health. Yeah, I mean, I flew, I mean, I, and I, mean, I, and it was great to get out of New York. <laughs> you know, I, haven't been, yeah. I haven't been there for the year before because my mother was ill and dying. And I had, so I hadn't been anywhere in like two, two and a half years at all. And it was just great to be on a plane. I, and I know the ventilation is good because I, I have friends who write about, write, write about the ventilation in planes. Oh, it's, it's great on the plane. They, their question is TSA and the gate. I know, so. I know. Well, I got TSA pre-check, so I hope that helps. TSA so pre is wonderful if you can afford it. I love it. Yeah. It's not that bad. It's, not, it's about $99. And some credit cards will pay, pay you back for it. But, uh, oh, cool. Yeah. So. Um, Anyway, I want to thank Robin Lloyd, who's president of CSW, who's a really great journalist with a great newsletter. And I just want to read the name of the newsletter. You can find it. It's called Smart, Useful Science Stuff about COVID-19. And then if you sign up for it, you'll get it for as long as Robin writes it. So, and George I just put the URL in the in the chat, and I want to thank everyone for their great questions, especially you, David. It's really it's really fun. I, I agree with Roxanne. It's, it's, this is fun. Okay, I'm I'm glad it's fun, and I want and thanks for doing it, and also um, thank you for giving the newsletter for free because some of them, most of them, are not on, free on Substack. So we appreciate it, and everyone stay safe out there. We are going to have some guests in the next few weeks. I'm just, um, one of them is actually a Pulitzer Prize winning historian whose name, whose name I am blanking on, um, but he, he's written, uh, he's at NYU and he wrote books about history of vaccines and about COVID hesitancy and uh, I think he's in two weeks and I'm looking forward to that. And um, we're hopefully going to have Dr. Moore on again, who answers, who's a vaccine expert and uh, loves to answer questions. Oh, okay. It's uh, David, David, Dr. David Oshinsky. We'll be our guest in, in a couple of weeks. All right. Thank you. And everyone stay safe out there. And Robin, who is not in San Francisco, but has a great background. Th thank you for, again for being on the show. And we appreciate it. And please keep up the good work because I, I really enjoy, I learn a lot from your newsletters. Okay. I'm going to say, say goodnight to everybody and stay safe and uh, enjoy the weekend. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.